We're here with Dean Karnazes today and we're really excited to be able to have a chat with him and see what he's been up to recently and maybe what he's going to be doing in the future. So hi Dean. Thank you for coming over to my humble abode. Oh man, yeah, thank you very much. We're filming in my living room. Yes, yeah. with this amazing view of Mount Tamilpay. <laughs> of the rain, yeah. 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 Epic. So have you, um, you managed to get out for a run today? I did. I went for about a 10 mile run yesterday, kind of an easy run. Oh, wow. um, I'm running the Napa Valley Marathon on Sunday. So yep. I'm going to try not running at all for two days, which is very unusual for me. <laughs> and see how it goes, yeah. Yeah, really long taper for you. Yeah, I did long taper, yeah. yeah. So what does an, an everyday run look like to you, an average run? Well, if I'm really like in a training block, uh, I'll get up at uh, 3.34 in the morning and uh, run up to the top of Mount Tam. So I'll run right. like a, a marathon before breakfast, but a trail marathon. Yeah. So, you know, four, four hours-ish, um, kind of easy, but some vertical. Yeah. And then I'll come back here. I work out of my house, so I've got a pull-up bar and a sit-up uh, mat, uh, and I'll do cycles of like HIIT training throughout the day. So high-intensity interval training with pull-ups, push-ups, uh, sit-ups, dips, burpees, um, jumping lunges, and I'll do like four or five of those uh, kind of sets, about a 12 to 15 uh, minute routine. I'll do about four or five of those throughout the course of the day, and then uh, in the afternoon, uh, I'll go for a, like a tempo run, but shorter, maybe 8 to 12 miles, but you know, at a faster pace. Not up Mount Tam then? Usually not, but no. maybe up one of the, you know, like Mount Baldy, or you know, there's a couple other, a okay. little bit lower peaks, yeah. yeah. Oh, we've been up there a couple of times actually. Up Baldy, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Lovely. Yeah, so I do hill repeats up that okay. final little push. It's nice, isn't it? Up there? Yeah, it's yeah. really nice. Yeah. Nice and open. Um, we're you... giving you all the inside secrets of yeah. running in northern Marin. Yeah. We're, we're actually really here just to grill Dean. Just to get the low down. Um, now, I've, I've read a few in a few places that you, you travel quite a lot for work. Um, how do you fit your training in around that travel? It's challenging. I mean, I'm uh, an opportunistic uh, trainer, I say, so if I have an opportunity, even if it's an hour, um, mm -hmm. I'll get after it pretty hard. And um, even if it's just in a gym on a treadmill, uh, mm -hmm. it'll be you know high intensity for an hour. I'll just do whatever I can. Um, the other thing when it comes to diet uh, is that um, I won't eat versus eating the wrong food. So I'll do kind of intermittent fasting when need be, um, because you know airplane food, uh, airport food and travel food is not always the best. So I, I carry food with me, but if I can't, if there's nothing available that's healthy, I won't. I'll just eat nothing. Versus, yeah, I find eating nothing is better than eating the wrong thing. Okay, mm. that's good advice. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and I, I completely understand what you're saying about the the airport food, and sometimes none of it appeals anyway. So yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, tough. Uh, so speaking of travel, uh, you, you spent quite a lot of time over the past few years visiting. Greece, where which where you're descended from, and yeah. researching your road, your book Road to Sparta. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, could you describe the Spartathlon to someone who perhaps hasn't really heard about it and what that involves and then its significance? Yeah, so the Spartathlon is an ultra marathon, and it's the recreation of the original quote unquote marathon. So it's um, in 490 um, BC. Uh, the um, Greeks were invaded by the Persians at, at a place called Marathon, which is, means fennel, a bay of fennel, because there's wild fennel that grows all over Greece, and this particular bay where they invaded was filled with fennel. So that's what Marathon means. <laughs> the only thing is like a 26.2 mile, no, it means fennel, field of fennel. So they sent this uh, messenger, Phidippides, or Phidippides, however you want to pronounce it, to recruit the Spartans to help battle uh, the Persians. And that uh, run is 153 miles, um, I think it's 216 kilometers, and I'm sorry, 246 kilometers, mm -hmm. and um, you have 36 hours to complete the run, and it's grueling. Only about a third of the starters finish, and it's mm -hmm. in, you know, southern Greece in September, so it's very warm. Uh, you know, a lot of it's on the road, unfortunately. So you're dealing with you know road traffic and all that kind of misery, and then you're climbing at this insane mountain in the middle of the night. Uh, but it's it's glorious. I mean, it's um, it's still my favorite ultra marathon. I've done you know ultra marathons all around the globe, and that's still my favorite. Yeah. 
that says a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's yeah, nice. and, it, and it comes across in the book as well how grueling it was, and, and really just how you were feeling throughout that whole process. And, a, and another thing that you've you've said is that the food that you chose to eat for that event probably contributed to the challenge. Yeah, so I, you know, being 100% Greek and being from the same area that uh, Philippides ran, um, I wanted to try to kind of recreate that experience, to kind of get in his head, because I'm writing the story that's kind of um, going back to uh, 490 um, BC in his time, and then flash forward to our modern time, but trying to really understand some of the, the ways he felt. And I thought one way to do that is to eat only the same foods he had access to, which were... Um, you know, figs, as you said, olives, um, this stuff called pastilli, which is uh, ground up sesame seeds and honey and cured meat and only drinking, only drinking water. So no, you know, sports drinks. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was very challenging. Um, I trained with these foods, obviously, mm -hmm. and I go out for, you know, eight hour training runs and everything was fine. Uh, but 24 hours eating only figs <laughs> is a different story. It's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, you eat figs. To be regular, right? I mean, you yeah. want, and when you're running uh, you 153 miles, eat. you don't want to be regular. You don't yeah, need so it's, for that. <laughs> it's kind of graphic, but I kind of had some GI issues after a point, and it became really a struggle to get to the finish line. Yeah. It makes the achievement all the better. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a better story, right? <laughs> for the book. Great yeah, story, yeah, so. yeah. Um, And do you have any plans to return? Yeah, in fact, uh, it's so ironic. Um, yesterday, I <laughs> submitted my application. So I still go through the application process. Hopefully I'll get selected. But yeah, so hopefully in uh, September this year, I'll be running again, eating regular food. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's, that was my next question, actually. Yeah. Would, you, would you try it again with the figs? Um, in principle, the figs sound like something that would be quite nice to eat on a run because they're quite moist and, you know, the fruit, they're high calorie, but not something that you'd recommend. <laughs> I know they were great for, like I said, up to eight hours yeah. in my training. They were fantastic and they worked as well, I think, as any modern athlete food. Mm -hmm. It's just with 24 hours, the amount of yeah. fiber, yeah. I think, is what really got to me. Yeah. To okay. so, so what do you normally choose to eat on a run? I, I know you've, uh, we've exchanged tweets in the mm -hmm. past and you've talked about nut butter being mm -hmm. a favorite. Yeah, nut butter still is a favorite and there's a lot of different nut butter companies for athletes now that are out there and there's a lot of variety um, with the nut butter. Uh, we talked about Cliff Bar, mm -hmm. and you know they make squeeze pouches of um, sweet potato that I really love, and oatmeal, and these are great yeah. foods. Yeah, that uh, are easy. You know, you just twist off the top, and you can uh, carry it with you, and it's very portable. Yeah, so we're going to ask actually whether you put the nut butters on something like bread or no, or just just straight. Yeah, straight. straight. I, I, actually, there's a company called Justin's Nut Butters, and. Mm -hmm. I started using their product about seven years, seven or eight years ago, mm -hmm. and they're based in Boulder. And I met Justin, a great guy. He's a runner as well. And I said, you know, your delivery system right now is a little pouch, and it's made for you know kids to tear up and you know put on a slice of apple. Okay. It's great athlete food, but it's just kind of a hassle, you know, to get into the. And mm -hmm. you know, he said, I don't see this as a future of athlete foods. I mean, I you know, I'm not going to do anything like a like a gel pack because I, I can't see athletes actually using just nut butters. And I kept using his butters, going, Justin, you got to do this, you got to do this. And other companies started doing it, yeah. yeah. Is he doing it now? No, he still just he hasn't changed for athletes. He, you know, he, um, he's a believer now in nut butters, yeah. but he sold the company to, I think, Kraft Foods or someone, yeah. Uh, okay. So in some European mountain races in particular, I've seen they serve olive oil that you can drink on the run. Is mm -hmm. that something that you've tried? Or? I've tried it, and the first time I was exposed to it, actually, I did the um, four desert races, which is a series of races across um, various deserts, and in the Sahara race, there was some um, Italian um, elite uh, forces guys, military guys, and all they brought for six days, it's six days of running, self-supported, so you have to carry all your own food, they brought these vials of olive oil, and the scientists had measured, it was 2,000 calories. So it was exactly 2,000 calories. That's what they needed to sustain themselves for the day. And it was what they said was the lightest, most concentrated, because you're trying to keep your path light. Yeah. yeah so every night, they were so funny. They were having um, a vial of olive oil. They brought powdered wine. <laughs> so Italian, because <laughs> they provide Italian. three liters of water, so you get water. So yeah. they brought powdered wine. Like, you know, they just pour some powder, make some wine, and cigars. 
So they'd have a vial of olive oil, <laughs> powdered wine, and a cigar. That was their daily meal so for six kidding. days. Yeah. That's pretty weird. I know yeah. how wine was such an essential. So, if you're Italian, you got to have wine, right? Yeah, what meal is complete? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's pretty unusual. Um, and in terms of diet, and your diet gets talked about quite regularly in the press. And you've described it as a Neanderthal-style diet. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, only in that if you know if you can't um, dig it from the earth, mm -hmm. uh, pick it from a tree. Uh, catch it with your hands, I really, I won't eat it. Yeah. So not much processed food, um, nothing refined, you know, nothing that has to go through a milling process. So mm -hmm. people say, well, you know, uh, we understand wheat is problematic. What about barley or oats? You know, you can't just pick up a, an oat and stick it in your mouth. It's got to go through a machine and be processed before you can eat it. So I don't eat it. Mm -hmm. um, I had a mentor, this guy named Jack LaLanne. And you probably don't know him. Yeah. He was like a, one of those fitness, you remember the like muscle beach guys? It's yeah. an American thing. He's one of the like original Muscle Beach guys, and you know he said to me one time, uh, "If man makes it, don't eat it, and if it tastes good, spit it out." <laughs> I'm like, I love this guy. <laughs> That's <laughs> great advice. That. Yeah. Yeah, and it's nice knowing where your foods come from as well, and as soon as it goes cooking your own. Yeah. 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 Your own. Do you, you have grow a lot your more control? Um, I grow my own herbs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, you know, in, in this area, as you guys know, now move, having been moved here, the, the access to good locally grown food is incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Not that in England it's not. I mean, you go to Covent Garden and it's daily. I mean, you can get whatever you want. It is. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Just, It doesn't grow quite as quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you don't yeah. have as much sunshine. So do your wife and kids follow a similar diet? My... Um, you know, my it, as a parent, um, and I should let me let me just digress a bit and say my diet has evolved. So uh, you know, people, some people watching this or listening to this might think, well, you're known as the guy who you know ordered a pizza one time and mm -hmm. ate it while you were running on the run. But people change, mm -hmm. and my diet has changed over the years. So I, I admit I used to eat a ton of junk food, and I changed my ways. And um, some of it was inspired because we had kids. So I said I got to clean up my diet because there's a story about Gandhi. And um, a mother brought her son to Gandhi and said, um, he, he's addicted to sugar. He eats so much sugar. You've got to tell him not to eat sugar. And Gandhi said to him, uh, to the mother, you come back in one month. And so she came back in one month. And Gandhi said to her son, you've got to stop eating sugar. It's really bad for you. And she said, well, why did you wait a month? And he said, because I had a quit sugar myself. <laughs> so I thought, I've got to lead by example. I mean, kids are really quick to spot hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as you say something and do something different, they notice that. So I thought I'd go to clean up my diet. Um, they were raised with a very healthy diet. Everything worked brilliantly until they got into school. And their kid, you know, kids are having chips and they're like, Dad, you've deprived us. <laughs> what have you done? You're a monster. I'm like, oh man. So um, they rebelled. And now they've gone full circle. Now they're like, oh, Dad, that was the greatest thing ever. Your diet was so good. I'm glad you, you, know, you brought us up like that. It, it takes that time to go through. I, my dad's a dentist, so ah. I didn't have a huge amount of sweets. Um, yeah. But you know, probably not, not quite the same, because I'm sure I had my fair share of desserts but, <laughs> you know, in terms of chocolate bars and sweets. I saved yeah. that until I was, went to school and then since then. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my wife's a dentist as well, but her diet, her diet is pretty good, but it, it's not quite as strict as mine, yeah. Um, yeah, so I've got a question about training, and I think it was in your Ultramarathon Man book that you mentioned your resting heart rate was around 30 beats a minute? It, it's about 38, yeah, 38. 38. So is that, was it always that low, or is this something you can actually make happen by training so much? Is it something if you were to go out daily that you could really bring that heart rate down, do you think? You, you can absolutely um, lower your heart rate through train, athletic training. That, mm. That's pretty well known and very well documented. Um, as low as mine is, that is a bit unusual. So okay. uh, they, they're not sure if that's a hereditary thing. You know, it should, certainly is an adaptation to training, but it could be hereditary as well. Uh, my mother comes from an island in Greece called Ikaria. It's where Icarus, the guy, the kid with the wax wings, landed. And it's one of the, the blue zones. I don't know, have you heard of the blue zones? Yeah. It's, um, it's seven uh, regions across the, the world where the indigenous population live the longest. And on this particular island in Greece, it's the highest con concentration of centenarians. 
of people that live a hundred and beyond, uh, they live on this particular island. I mean, my mother's so you know my gene pool is from half my gene pool is from that from that island, oh, okay. and they grow all their own food. And I mean the people in their hundreds are like mountain goats. They're, they're gardening every day. They're climbing. You know it's amazing. Yeah, they don't have cars. I'm very but, lucky. Yeah, I'm lucky to have come from that background. Yeah, yeah that's brilliant. So if someone who's full of energy and dislikes sitting, how do you handle when you can't run? So if you've got an injury or something. <laughs> this interview is killing crazy. me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I mean, I do sit down for yeah. this. <laughs> uh, you know, knock on wood, uh, I've never had an injury. So I, I don't know what it would be like not to run. Uh, I don't even want to think what no, it would be not, like. Yeah, it would be, it'd be, yeah, it'd be horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a little question about when you're out on your training runs, do you often get stopped by people who, <laughs> who recognize you as the, the ultra marathon man, the famous ultra runner? Does it kind of interrupt I have a training? weird life, let's just put it that, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I get, yeah, that happens all the time, and yeah. it's so random, and it, it, it doesn't just happen in the US, it happens more overseas, actually, more in certain okay. countries. Yeah, I mean, um, there are certain European countries, like Portugal, um, Italy, uh, mm -hmm. Greece, of course, Greece, yeah. uh, where I, you know, people notice me in the airport. They're like, "Oh my God, the ultra marathoner guy," and, and that it, it's bizarre. Must be. Yeah, That's it's really bizarre. Well, I mean, I was just when I just flew home um, from Europe, I was walking through SFO, and there are two guys walking toward me, and one guy's like, "Oh my God, oh my, I can't believe it. Oh, it's really you, isn't it?" Yeah. And, and, and he's, his buddy's like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> One guy was a triathlete, he totally knew me. The other guy is like his business partner, wasn't, had no idea who I was. Yeah. But he does now. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yes, you've, um, we understand you've started one of the, the North Face Endurance Challenge, the series. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, really, that you, you consider that to be your, your baby. Is that correct? You know, it's funny because people, a lot of people said, "What you know, what do you want your legacy to be?" And I thought, I'm not worthy of a legacy. Uh, but if there is a legacy that uh, I'm proud to have created, it is this event. So okay. it's uh, the whole thing was my idea. It's it's a two day festival of running of every distance from a 5k to a 50 mile race yeah. and everything in between. And the idea is, you know, on the theme of the North Face, never stop exploring, to kind of trade up. Like if you've run a 5K, sign up for the 10K. Explore okay. your limits. If you've done the 10K, try the half marathon. You know, if you try the half marathon, try a trail marathon. So you know, explore. If you've done a marathon, try one of the ultras. So it's about really pushing yourself to go that. Pushing one yourself. Step further. Yep. And That's and having good. athletes of all ages and abilities all in one festival area, kind of cross pollinating because some of the elites kind of. You know they're they're so caught up in their world of I want to be you know top ten or you know I want to win this thing, mm -hmm. and they forget that what they do is amazing. And to a five k person, this you know a guy just said I just ran fifty miles. They don't care if it took you you know twenty yeah. hours or, or six hours. They're like you ran what? You did it? Yeah. yeah. So that kind of humbles I think the elites and and inspires the the sub elites. Yeah. True. Yeah, absolutely. And it makes it it makes it seem more achievable when you're meeting and interacting with people who have done these things as and well. That, yeah, I mean, that's what I love about our sport is that, you know, here are these elites and they're just, ca you know, they're just, they're just guys and girls. Yeah. They're just interacting with, you know, casual runners. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, it's had that effect on us because we've signed up for the San Francisco edition. Ah, um, We signed up for bravo. the 50 miles. Oh, <laughs> which is, which is the first are you ready to die? Yeah. 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 It's, so. yeah, we've got a few months, so hopefully the training will go well enough that we and it's your first time doing the uh, the endurance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our thinking was that it's it's in November and we're sitting here at the beginning of March. So hopefully by the time we get to November, we're going to have done some really great training. And be we'll see that mountain up there. Yeah, <laughs> so it's been, it's been a long time running yeah. from here to there. Yeah, I'll yeah. Start waking no, it's up a there. great race. And um, this year uh, we changed the course, so we finish um, at Christie Field now, which is finished by running across the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's really spectacular. Um, only that you can see the finish line when you hit the north side of the bridge. You're like, oh, it looks so close, but, <laughs> but it's not that close. No, it's yeah. not. But it's a glorious finish, yeah. Well, hopefully the, you know, the context will be kind of compensation for having the pain of having to run all that way. I think so. And you know, the, the gravitational pull of seeing that finish line just will 
yeah, tow you on in. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Hopefully, we'll we'll make it there. I'll see you there. I start off every single race, and I'm there okay. at the finish. So, and I hand out the award. So, I'm sure you guys will be on the podium. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Just to finish this award would be great, and a glass of wine, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, speaking of challenges, uh, we've talked about Spartathlon. Um, what else have you got lined up for the coming year? You know, my typical year, I probably run. 20 to 30 marathons like if I'm in a city and there's a marathon which almost every weekend there is a marathon somewhere um, like Napa Valley this this weekend I'm here I'm not traveling I'm gonna run Napa Valley uh, so 20 to 30 marathons um, probably half dozen or more ultras of 100 miles or further uh, this year I was hoping to set out on a global expedition to run a marathon in every country of the world in one year so I once ran 50 marathons in all of the 50 United States in 50 days, and it was just such a great adventure. I combined you know, everything I love, adventure, uh, exploration, and running and athletics. So I thought I can take the same footprint and go global. That was supposed to happen this year. There are 203 countries. I've been working with the United Nations and the U.S. Department of State yeah. to get all the passports and permits to get into these places. Um, unfortunately, uh, it kind of fell through this year. So anyone um, who's kind of familiar with this story, they're probably thinking, you sound like a broken record, like you've been discussing this for now, what is it, five or six years, and I have. Uh, it's not easy to pull this off. And I've, I've been failing for five or six years. I failed again this year. And I will continue to fail until I succeed. So one day I'm gonna pull this off, and it's gonna be glorious. I'm gonna invite the local country people and each of the countries I visit to run with me. Um, of the 203 countries, uh, only 109 actually have organized marathons. You know, like the UK, the London Marathon, obviously here we have tons of marathons. Um, but the rest of the countries don't have an organized marathon. So I've been working with Google to GPS a route um, in that country when I'm there just to make a marathon and have people come out and we'll just run this marathon, you know, this 26.2 miles. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, so you might actually start some so it could be the start of marathons, cool, yeah, yeah, marathons to come. Yeah. It sounds like a fantastic challenge, and when you manage to pull it off, it's a, it's going to be a great adventure, and I'm sure it'll make an excellent book once you've, uh, when it's all, all done. Well, sign up for a country and come join me. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely will do. Tahiti. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> UK. Nicole. Yeah, the UK. <laughs> that sounds phenomenal. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. It's been great chatting. Great really chatting with you, you and uh, I you. look forward to keeping in touch and look forward to seeing you in November. Absolutely, for that finish yeah. time. Great, thank you very much, and thanks for watching everyone. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. See you down the road.